What's up, everybody? I'm Dr. Garrett Rossi, a board-certified psychiatrist, and I make tons of mental health content here on YouTube. If you are new to this channel, I would love for you to become a member of this community. It really helps me to know that this information is valuable to you. And if you're returning, thank you so much for the support. Now, this weekend, a documentary dropped on Netflix called How to Change Your Mind, and this is based on a book by Michael Pollan many years ago now. I can't remember exactly what year it came out. But it's a very popular book talking about psychedelics and the mind and how they can be used potentially to treat mental health conditions. So I thought, what better time than this week to discuss the current state of psychedelic medication in psychiatry? So we're going to go ahead and crack into all the details about the current state of psychedelic medication, how it's used, what the mechanisms of action are, and whether or not it's ready for prime time, which I think is the biggest question many people have. So there's no hotter topic in psychiatry than the reemergence of psychedelics as therapeutic tools for the treatment of mental illness. When S-ketamine gained its FDA approval in March of 2019, it really opened the door for medications like MDMA, psilocybin, mescaline, as, to present themselves as possible therapeutic agents for use in psychiatric treatment. Now, I'm excited about these new options. So I don't want you to take this talk as like a little bit of a downer on psychedelics. I'm not, I'm very hyped for them. I'm very excited to see what goes on in the future. But what I wanna really be sure of, just like I do with cannabis or any other of these uh, scheduled one substances that are starting to become popular topics, I wanna make sure that the science backs up the experiences of the individual people using these medications in uncontrolled settings. What we have to remember is most of the data that we have about these things is largely people's experiences, personal experiences with the use of psychedelic drugs. So I want to make sure the science backs it up. Now, this so-called psychedelic era was a time of social, musical, artistic change here in the United States. And the change was influenced by the use, of course, of psychedelic drugs. So the music, the social scene, the artistic scene that developed out of the use of these psychedelic drugs was known as the psychedelic era, and it lasted from the mid-1960s to the mid-1970s. Now, although this era lasted for some time, it largely fell out of favor for a few reasons, but mostly it was legal reasons. This wasn't really a topic in modern psychiatry until just recently, but we'll talk more about what those legal reasons were and why the psychedelics largely fell out of favor. But now, it seems like overnight, everybody's excited about psychedelics again. The New York Times is writing articles about them. We're seeing Netflix documentaries talking about them. Books are being written about them. And even your local evening news is covering psychedelics and mental health. So what's the story with these psychedelics? Are they ready to be prescribed to everyone? Should we be prescribing psilocybin, MDMA, mescaline for all mental health treatment? Or do we have to pump the brakes a little bit here and say, what is the real evidence supporting these medications? And how can we learn and grow from this evidence and really make sure it's robust enough to recommend it to people safely and effectively? So I'm a bit of a history buff myself. Maybe if I didn't end up studying medicine and science, I would have went into history and maybe become a history professor at some college, right? But that didn't happen. I'm here now doing psychiatry talks. But anyway, the point is, there's a long history of hallucinogens in medicine, right? Hallucinogen use has been around for millennia. For over five millennia, humans have been attempting to alter their state of consciousness. Some have argued it goes even further back. Some people would even say that our primate ancestors consumed large quantities of fermented fruit to alter their state of consciousness, the so-called drunken monkey hypothesis, which led to the advent of alcohol being something that we consume on a regular basis, right, as, as humans. I'm not sure how correct that theory is, but it's safe to say that psychedelics have been around for a long time and they've been used for a long period of time. A little bit of brief history though about the traditional psychedelics that I'm gonna be talking about here. So in 1943, this chemist named Albert Hoffman invented LSD by accident. He accidentally stumbled upon the synthesis of LSD and he started this research all the way back in 1938, but then in 1943 announced 
not only that he synthesized LSD, but he was using it. He was sampling it, right? And he was, he was taking LSD. And um, in 1943, this became known as Bicycle Day. And Bicycle Day has to do with what he did after he took the LSD. So he took the LSD and then he bicycled around uh, his neighborhood and he had all these mystical experiences while he was biking. So that's how it became known as Bicycle Day. So not only did he synthesize it, but he was essentially getting high on his own supply, which is a rule you're not supposed to follow, which is a rule rather you are supposed to follow. Don't get high on your own supply. And in 1957, he also was the first person to isolate psilocybin from the hallucinogenic mushroom. So this guy was really influential and um, a real big player in terms of the advent of psychedelic medicine. Now, in the 1940s, LSD was actually marketed as a drug for psychotherapy. So what you would do is you would market LSD to psychotherapists and you would tell them that you can enhance their psycho, your psychotherapy and you can speed up the process of getting people better by using LSD and your psychotherapeutic techniques concomitantly or together. Now, this is the so-called drug-assisted psychotherapy that's making a huge comeback today. This is exactly what they're talking about. Unfortunately, there were over a thousand published studies looking at this. The problem with the studies was they were mostly small, they were uncontrolled, they really didn't tell us anything definitive. So they weren't very, the point is, although they published a thousand papers or so on this topic, they were not very good papers. Now in the 1970s, this is where the legal system got involved because this is when a lot of these medications were placed into what we call Schedule 1 status here in the United States, and meaning that they essentially are highly addictive and don't have any purpose, any medical purpose, right? So in the 1970s, most of these drugs were placed into Schedule 1 status and made it exceedingly difficult to not only study the medications for therapeutic use, but to even, to even think about obtaining them was very, very difficult. So there was no way to do proper randomized controlled trials proving that these medicines actually were effective for the treatment of mental illness. Now, a randomized controlled trial, just for your knowledge, is considered by many to be the highest standard of scientific evidence, so that's what we really need to be able to prove that these medicines work, and we're still facing those same legal barriers right now as many of these medications still remain in Schedule One status. I want to make a few comments about the classes of hallucinogens and a little bit about the terminology and definitions because it's a bit wishy-washy, so to speak. For years, when somebody would say psychedelics, you would think of traditional psychedelics or classic psychedelics like psilocybin or LSD. However, the term now includes other medicines. We might include ketamine and some of the other disassoci dissociative anesthetics, and we might, in, we might also include things like MDMA or ecstasy, which is now an empathogen, right? So we have other medicines that we're considering to be hallucinogens now, or psychedelics now, right? So the term psychedelic is derived from two words in Greek, actually, which, you know, usually everything in medicine is Greek or Latin or something like that, right? So two words in Greek meaning mind manifesting. So what that means and how we use that medically to define these medicines is a little difficult. But essentially, psychedelic and hallucinogen are now terms that are interchangeable. As of now, maybe that will change. But these are interchangeable these days, even though they do have separate meanings like mind manifesting. You might be wondering also what are the therapeutic targets that psychedelics are currently under investigation for, like which disorders are we trying to treat with them? And it's important to point out before I give you a list of the exact disorders where, that are under investigation currently, it's important to know that the typical study will include psychotherapy before, during, and after treatment with the psychedelic medication. So people are generally given one to two, one to two doses of psychedelic medication, and then they're getting psychotherapy before they start the treatment, they're getting psychotherapy during administration of the treatment, and they're also getting psychotherapy after they complete the psilocybin or whatever psychedelic medication they're being given. The disorders currently under investigation that I was able to find were depression, anxiety, PTSD, OCD, cancer-related stress and psychological issues, addiction, smoke and cessation, sexual dysfunction, 
headaches, and inflammatory disorders. Now, maybe the best and most studied area for psilocybin specifically is in the palliative care setting and end-of-life care setting. It seems to work exceedingly well for dealing with, say, can cancer-related stress and psychological um, distress resulting from either chronic illness or end-of-life care. So end-of-life care is already pretty well validated in the research as a use of psychedelic medication. Okay, guys, so let's talk about the mechanism of action. What makes psychedelics so great and what makes them tick? Why do they actually work to treat psychiatric illness? The primary mechanism of action that I want to turn your attention to is something called 5-HT2A receptor stimulation. So these medications like psilocybin, for example, work primarily as 5-HT2A. These are serotonin 2A receptors, and they're going to work to stimulate that receptor. Now we know that the 5-HT2A receptor is the most abundant serotonin receptor in the central nervous system. It's especially abundant in the cortex of the brain. Now when you stimulate these 5-HT2A receptors, it will increase the release of glutamate in uh, not really a, a totally coherent way, but let's just say it increases the release of glutamate in the cortex. And we think that that's the primary mechanism of action by which these medications work. Now when you stimulate 5-HT2A receptors in the visual cortex, we know that they can lead to visual hallucinations. And stimulation of the ventral tegmental area can also produce a sensation that is similar to that of schizophrenia, where the person will experience possibly delusions, auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations, etc. And most of the atypical antipsychotics, actually almost all of the atypical antipsychotics, share one thing in common. They all bind to and block these 5-HT2A receptors. Now, if you were to give one of these atypical antipsychotic medications to somebody taking a psychedelic, it would mitigate the effects of the psychedelic. So in this section, guys, I want to talk to you about neurobiology a little bit more because I often get questions from people or comments from people in the comment section that says something like this. Um, we don't know enough about the levels of serotonin that are necessary to, you know, treat mental illness and Therefore, the medications that we give that increase serotonin, for example, are invalid because we don't really have a defined limit or a defined range of serotonin in the CNS that's appropriate. Okay, fair enough, but to be honest with you, I don't think about mental illness that way. I don't think about the treatments or the medications that, that way. And that's because these people that are making these comments are thinking about mental illness in the wrong way and far too simplistically. When they're thinking about what these medications that we use actually do, they're thinking about it in the simplest form, most likely saying that this is a so-called chemical imbalance, right? And most psychiatrists no longer believe in the chemical imbalance theory. I personally never use the term chemical imbalance with any of my patients, and I don't even believe it's true. So if you're thinking about it in that simple way and you're commenting here, then you know, you're know you kind of off base because it's not how we're thinking about it, right? We think about mental illness and as problems in neural circuits. So the new thinking in psychiatry is that there's an issue with your circuitry, right? And I think about it in terms of neural circuits, nodes, and networks. And that is what we're looking to alter in our patients in order to cure them or at least help them be treated for mental illness and other problems, right? So what medications do, including the psychedelics, is they achieve an alteration in the connectivity of these networks and they allow the brain the ability to form new connections that are going to be more resourceful to the patient. Now, I wanna continue this a little bit further because it's important to understand. We all have what's called a default mode network. You might be asking, what is this default mode network? Well, this is famously active when the person is not focused on the outside world. So the person is not stimulated by external stimuli in the outside world, but you are alert, you are there, you're just in a state of say daydreaming, right? Daydreaming is a great example. So the default mode network is active during periods when we're daydreaming, for example. What psychedelics do is they decrease brain connectivity in the default mode network. So they, this has been proven time and time again. We have a little diagram to, dish, to demonstrate that. So this decreased brain connectivity in the default mode network is followed by the establishment of new connections. 
And hypothetically, it's this rewiring of the brain or these new connections that are formed that allows for the replacement of the faulty connections that were resulting in mental illness and the formation, of course, of new healthy connections through the use of psychotherapy provided during the psychedelic experience, right? So this so psychotherapy is also an important component of rewiring the brain. The psilocybin, for example, just allows that to be possible and at a much more rapid pace than otherwise would be accomplished with just psychotherapy alone. And this may be why, at the end of the day, the antidepressant effects of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, for example, last far beyond other interventions and don't require as frequent of dosing. Now, we do have and we do know that there's identifiable changes in these networks, right? This network connectivity changes and that it coincides with the subjective improvement that the patient will tell you about. Okay, so what about the mystical experience or tripping? Is tripping required for a therapeutic effect to occur? And that's a good question, right? Reasonable question. Do you have to have this mystical experience in order for you to be effectively treated? Well, there is something called the mystical experience questionnaire. I'm going to pop it up right here so you guys can see what it looks like. And it's been validated and used in studies for psychedelic treatments. It seems that the more profound the mystical experience for the patient, the better the treatment effect, at least subjectively. Now, we don't know beyond subjectively whether it's, it's absolutely essential. And that might be the moral of this part of the discussion, right? While the spiritual experience of many individuals who are taking these medications is profound and meaningful to the individual, so they have a profound, meaningful, mystical experience, we're not sure that the trip is required to produce the therapeutic effect, at least not at this time. So no discussion would be complete without talking about the side effects of psychedelic use. Now, while some may claim that there are no adverse effects to plant-based medicine, that's simply not true. What we do see often with these treatments and studies is that there's things like transient increases in blood pressure, breathing rate, and body temperature. We also see things like loss of appetite, dry mouth, sleep disturbance, uncoordinated movements, panic, paranoia, psychosis, and even bizarre behaviors. So these things are not without some side effects, and those are the short-term side effects of using the medication, but what about the long-term side effects? Is there any long-term side effects? And there's two that I wanna alert you guys to. One of them is persistent psychosis. So persistent psychosis is a series of continuing mental problems, including things like visual disturbances, disorganized thinking, paranoia, and mood changes. So somebody can actually become persistently psychotic using these medications. So there is some danger there, kind of like cannabis, right? Prolonged cannabis use, especially early in life, could potentially result in the development of longer term mental health conditions. The other one I want to alert you guys to is probably the more famous one, and that is hallucinogen persisting perception disorder. Ooh, that is a mouthful. HPPD, hallucinogen persisting perception disorder. And this is where the person has those recurrences of certain experiences that they had during the use of the drug, right? When they were using the drug, they had certain experiences, and the person has a recurrence of these experiences. Now, that could be things like hallucinations, visual disturbances, right? That's the typical things that we see during the acute phase of taking the medication. These experiences can happen without warning. So they can happen or occur within a few days of use of the medication. They can also occur years later after taking the medication. So some people have, again, a, per a persistence of these perceptual disturbances. And often these experiences are mistaken for things like neurological disorders such as strokes and brain tumors. So what we could say at this time about the current state of psychedelics in psychiatry is they are under investigation. That's the best way to put it. Psychedelics in psychiatry is under investigation. We do not yet know if they are safe or effective for the treatment of mental illness on a mass scale. So we don't know if we can prescribe these medications to everybody who has depression, for example. We do have some encouraging evidence. There's some evidence to support the use of psilocybin. There's some evidence that these medicines are going to have a profound effect, but there is an absence of large randomized controlled trials proving efficacy and safety. They just don't exist yet. They are probably on the way. Psychedelics ultimately then 
are not ready for cl clinical practice, right? We're not ready to implement this in daily practice, and they should not be recommended as treatment for mental illness until the proper studies have been conducted. So I'm gonna hold the video there. I'm gonna make another one most likely about the rest of the psychedelics and how they're used in psychiatry currently. And I would love to hear your comments and questions below. And please, if you haven't done so already, consider subscribing to the channel. It really helps me to keep making this content for you.